on this highest, holiest day indeed in the Christian year, let us consider Matthew's account of Jesus' resurrection. We shall begin together in chapter 27, verses 62 to 66, and then let's just go through verse 15 of Matthew 28, shall we? Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when Jesus was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days I am to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. The guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said, Come, see the place where Jesus was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you so. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and take word to my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers and said, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And shall we pray? Oh God, indeed we gather not to be blessed, but to bless. We gather not to receive, but to give. Oh God, we give you thanks for the life, the death, ministry, resurrection and coming again of Jesus the Christ. We thank you for this highest, holiest day. And oh God, we need it every year, but perhaps it is especially timely for our congregation now as we have experienced sudden death in our church with Phil and with Luann. And so I ask that we might especially be encouraged now with our resurrection hope with the reality that just as Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we too one day be raised 
from the dead and we will share in Jesus' resurrected state. Oh God, we give you thanks. It sounds too good to be true. Help us to find a way to believe and to commit. In Jesus' name, oh God, we submit this in each one of our prayers unto you. Amen. The good news, the gospel of Jesus the Christ is ever so attractive. Listen to it, if you will, on this Easter Sunday of 2023. God loves you. The fullness of God, Paul tells us, dwell in Jesus the Christ. Paul tells us that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. In obedience to God, Jesus went to a cross, a cruel Roman cross. When we put our trust in Christ, Jesus' obedience that led Him to a cross becomes our obedience in the sight of God. When we put our faith and our trust in Christ, God forgives our sins. God forgives our disobedience. We know this to be true because we are a people that believe, indeed, that God raised Jesus from the dead and put His seal of approval on this good news of the Messiah. And so, in place of hell, in place of condemnation, we get heaven and we get abundant life. That's good news. That's attractive 365 days a year. I've heard people who just can't get there. I've heard people who don't believe in iota of what I just said say they so wish they could believe. Well, I guess so. <laughs> Does it get any better than that? Matthew, in his account of Jesus' resurrection, he tells us, he encourages us to find a way to believe, to find a way to commit, to find a way to get on board of this glorious gospel reality. The message is so inviting, the message is so attractive that if necessary, we must work to overcome obstacles of disbelief. If necessary, we must work to more fully commit our lives to this message of a crucified Savior raised from the dead and coming again. Whatever obstacles there are in our lives to belief, whatever obstacles there are in our lives to full commitment, we need to find a way to get through them, to get over them, to go under them, whatever it may be. For example, Matthew says, and this is just one example that is an obstacle to belief for some folks. It was a story. It was a rumor that circulated in Matthew's day. It seems clear when you read early Christian literature, it seems clear that the tomb that Jesus was laid in by Joseph Arimathea of Arimathea and then of course John will add Nicodemus, but it seems clear that the tomb that Jesus was laid in was empty. Yeah, it, it was empty. The question then is, how did he get empty? <laughs> did somebody move his body from this tomb of a wealthy man 
to another tomb? Did the disciples come and steal the body? Or was he in fact raised from the dead? <coughs> a lot of people that don't believe this stuff at all will grant to you that there was an empty tomb. So the question is, how did the tomb become empty? Well, one theory that was alive in Jesus' day was that, Je was that Jesus' disciples stole the body of Jesus and then lied about his resurrection. And so Matthew says, look, if you've heard that tale, if you've heard that story, and if you think that's a good remedy for the problem of the empty tomb, well, no, you need to get over it. You need to go around it. You need to go below it. If that's an obstacle to belief for you, you need to find a way to overcome it. And so this text that we have, this part about the disciples or uh, the chief priest and the elders going to Pilate and saying, let us secure the tomb. Let us put guards by the tomb. And then let us seal the tomb. Because if we don't, we remember that Jesus had said He would raise from the dead on the third day. And if we don't do that, the disciples will come and steal the body and say that in fact that is what happened. This is unique to Matthew's Gospel. You don't find it in Mark. You don't find it in Luke. You don't find it in John. You only find it in Matthew. And then, when in fact, the guards are instructed to lie about the nature of Jesus' resurrection, that too is only found in the Gospel of Matthew. Now, Matthew says that the religious leaders asked Pilate to order the tomb secure with a guard and with a seal. The idea of the seal is much like Daniel chapter 6. Remember Daniel in the lion's den? Daniel was put into the lion's den and a stone rolled in front of the den and then it was sealed with the king's signet ring. That way if the seal is broken, you know that somebody has interfered with the den or with the tomb. But after Jesus had risen, the religious leaders gave money to soldiers to say disciples, Jesus' disciples, stole Jesus' body. Now, notice verse 15, if you will. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story was widely spread among the Jews, and it is to this day. Matthew says, look, even in my day, when I'm writing this account of Jesus' resurrection, there are still people circulating this nasty rumor that Jesus' disciples came and stole the body. It started very early, Matthew says, soon after Jesus' resurrection, and it continues to circulate today. Now, what is ironic about this? Did you notice this when the text was read? That Jesus' opponents, the chief priests and the religious leaders, tried to stop a nasty rumor that they themselves then went on to spread. They tried to stop a lie that would develop that they themselves then told. The whole goal of asking Pilate to secure the tomb with a guard and with a seal was to avoid people saying that Jesus' body had been stolen by his disciples. So they do that, but then after Jesus' resurrection, and he appears to Mary Magdalene and Mary and says, go to Galilee and tell the rest that I'll meet them there. After the resurrection, then the chief priests, they go to the guards and they pay them a large sum of money to say exactly what they were trying to prevent from being said, which was that while we were asleep, while the soldiers were asleep, Jesus' disciples came and stole the body. The Gospels, all four of them, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, are primarily apologetic literature. 
That is, they are defenses of the Christian faith. They are not objective. They are very biased. They are pro-Jesus from chapter 1 to the last chapter of each gospel. And they were written by Christians intended to help others find a way to believe this message that just seems too good to be true. So I ask you on this Easter Sunday, I ask you, do you find the message attractive? At this point, I'm not asking you if you believe it. At this point, I'm not asking you if you're willing to commit to it. I'm just asking you, do you find this message attractive? Listen again. God loves you. Isn't that magnificent? God loves you. The fullness of this God that loves you, all of this God that loves you, dwell in the person of Jesus the Christ. Jesus, by virtue of His resurrection, is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first one to be resurrected before the final resurrection. In obedience to God, Jesus went to a cross. He went to a cruel Roman cross. We, we wear crosses around our necks today as symbols of religious devotion, and that is fine. But that would have looked really odd in the first century, as if you're wearing an electric chair around your neck. In obedience to God, Jesus went to a cross. And get this, when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, Though we are sinful, though we are a disobedient people, when we put our faith and our trust in Christ, in the sight of God, Jesus' obedience becomes our obedience and we are forgiven of our sins, we are forgiven of our disobedience, and instead of condemnation in hell, we are granted eternal life and abundant life through Christ. Ah, that's the message, not just on Easter, but every day, but that's the message. And do you find it attractive? Do you find it appealing? If so, whatever is holding you back, find a way. <laughs> whatever is keeping you from belief, Get rid of it. Go over it. Go under it. Go around it. Go through it. Whatever it is that is keeping you from a fuller commitment to Christian faith, to Christian faith, and to the Church of Jesus the Christ, if you find it attractive, whatever is in your way, find a way to remove it. That's what Matthew says. Uh, you heard that story about the disciples coming and stealing the body and saying he was raised from the dead? Ha, 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 yeah. Let me tell you about that. Check that one off. We've dealt with that. They've been saying that for years and years now. The irony is that the people that wanted to prevent that story, they ended up using it themselves. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Don't worry about that. We got it. In his confessions, I think I've gone two Sundays now without quoting Augustine to you. So we've got to come back to Augustine today. I, I just read this Saturday morning uh, in Book 11. In his confessions, Augustine tells a joke. Now, Augustine is not known for humor. Right? He's a pretty serious dude. He's into 
predestination and he's into he's into sin and he's into you know God saving us from sin and, you know he's into really serious serious stuff and topics. In fact, this joke that he tells he doesn't like it. <laughs> he says he doesn't like the joke, but I do. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell it. I think it's good. He says, ah, "Here's a joke. You ready for this?" What was God doing before He created the heavens and the earth? Right? You ever have any of your children ask you that kind of stuff? What was God doing before He created the heavens and the earth? I don't know, what else? Does, 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 does God have a beginning? That, you know? And Augustine says the joke goes this way. What was God doing before He made heaven and earth? He was preparing a special place in hell for those who get hung up on questions we cannot know the answers to. <laughs> I love that. Oh, I love that. What was God doing before He created the heavens and the earth? He was preparing a special place in hell for those people who get hung up on questions that we cannot know the answers to. Hear me, church. You don't have to have it all figured out to believe. You don't have to have it all figured out to more fully commit your life to the Lordship of Jesus the Christ. You can be bothered by why is it that people die suddenly and prematurely in the prime of their lives. That question can bother you when you still believe and you still fully commit. You can wonder why is it that natural disasters strike innocent people and kill? You can wonder about that and not have an answer to it and not have it figured out. That's okay. You can wonder how in the world can a dead person be raised? I've been to a thousand funerals and I've never seen it happen before. How in the world can that happen? You can wonder about that and have questions about that and still believe and still fully commit your lives to the Lordship of Jesus the Christ. It's all fun. It's all good. Why did the good die young? I don't know. Why did the innocent suffer? I don't know. Why are children abused? I don't know. Why do people go hungry? I don't know. <laughs> but man... <laughs> Isn't this just so attractive? Are you with me on this Easter Sunday? That God loves you. That the fullness of His God dwelt in Jesus the Christ. This Jesus the Christ is the firstborn from the dead. And that when we put our faith and trust in Jesus the Christ, His obedience becomes our obedience in the sight of God and our sins are forgiven. And in place of hell, we get eternal life and abundant life. Ha ha! Blow me away! <laughs> Knock me over! Well, do you find it attractive? If so, I suspect the Holy Spirit of God is working in your life. So on this Easter Sunday, I beg you, I beg you, Find a way. Go over and go under and go around and go through. I don't care. Find a way to believe. Find a way to more fully commit your lives to the church of Jesus the Christ. Just find a way. Please, I beg of you, on behalf of Christ, just find a way.